This week in the mail, I received my May 2020 edition of the Church of the Brethren Messenger magazine. With a line from Psalm 30 in big letters highlighted on the cover, Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And these lines from our 2020 moderator, Paul Mundy, written in the annual conference article within. We don't just differ. We dig at each other with deepening disregard. And the line directly following that, it's painful to experience such contempt in culture, but it's agonizing, even maddening, to encounter it in the church. Suggesting that we may yet be in a time of weeping in the night, but that there is hope for joy if we can come together for the right reasons and with a missional focus. It also brought to mind a piece I wrote for Brethren Press back in October that would have been featured on the bulletin cover for last week, which completely coincidentally, but actually very poetically, would have been the closest Sunday to the one-year anniversary of the very first Sunday I preached officially as a pastor of the Eel River Community Church of the Brethren, April 28, 2019. The selected scripture text for the bulletin cover was Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, which reads, They spent their time learning from the apostles, and they were like family to each other. They also broke bread and prayed together. Everyone was amazed by the many miracles and wonders that the apostles worked. All the Lord's followers often met together, and they shared everything they had. They would sell their property and possessions and give the money to whoever needed it. Day after day, they met together in the temple. They broke bread together in different homes and shared their food happily and freely while praising God. Everyone liked them, and each day the Lord added to their group others who were being saved. I reflected. The fellowship of believers detailed in Acts sounds like the perfect relationship. Acts 2.44 tells us, All the Lord's followers often met together, and they shared everything they had. If we follow the biblical blueprint for how to be ideal Christians, we face high expectations. Often we only see our church family at church. Between working different jobs and juggling busy social lives, being together with our church family more than once or twice a week may be difficult. Not to mention, sharing all our physical possessions seems impossible. So how are we called to be a strong fellowship of believers despite all the challenges of modern life? There is a South African philosophy known as Ubuntu, which is often translated, I am because we are. It is best explained with the story of a social scientist who had been working in an African village. He obtained a basket of fruit and proposed a game. He put the basket of fruit near a tree and asked the children to race toward it. The person who reached it first would get all the fruit. To his amazement, they all joined hands and reached the basket at the same time, sharing it with one another. In explanation, they replied, how can one of us be happy if all the other ones are sad? South African theologian Desmond Tutu described Ubuntu saying, When I dehumanize you, I inexorably dehumanize myself. Perhaps our calling today is not to follow the biblical examples of Christian community so literally. Instead, we are called to be family in Christ, brothers and sisters who love each other no matter what, united through our empathy for each other. Rather than believers who are always together and share every possession, we are called to be believers held together by a common spirit. In Christ, we seek to respect and understand one another. This week at the grocery store, 
My manager hung up a banner that reads, Heroes work here. For me, a hero is someone whose main reason for acting is self-sacrifice for the good of others. I don't necessarily consider myself a hero in this context. If I had plenty of money and security and was choosing to work at the store purely so that they could stay open for others who need food, perhaps. But I am working at the store mainly for my own gain. To have money to live, to keep a roof above my head and the heads of my loved ones, and to have food for myself. For me, working does not seem more heroic now than it ever did before because those motivations have not changed. To me, heroism is selfless. I believe Jesus was a hero. He did not benefit from dying on a cross. He suffered and sacrificed himself for no reason other than the benefit of every other person. We are witness to another act of prophetic heroism in the story of the martyr Stephen, who we see in this morning's scripture text. From Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60, just five chapters after the scene we read about the happy family of believers depicted in Acts chapter 2, we see the darker side of what it meant to be a part of that early family of Christians standing up for their faith, a side that sadly is still present in many parts of our world today. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. It's a moving and a graphic scene, and witness to it all is none other than Saul, later to be Paul, another of the pillars of early Christianity. Yet, as William Barclay points out in his examination of this text, the man who was to become the apostle to the Gentiles thoroughly agreed with the execution of Stephen. Despite this, Barclay concludes, however hard he tried, Saul could not forget the way in which Stephen had died. The blood of the martyrs even thus early had begun to be the seed of the church. The martyrs we read about in the Bible are extreme examples of heroes. In keeping with the calendar, however, I'd like to transition to another type of heroes. From martyrs to mothers. The relationship of a mother within the context of family is often not a perfect relationship, as in Acts chapter 2, but closer to the concept of Ubuntu, I am because we are. It is a position that often can lend itself to self-sacrifice and acts of selflessness, to moments akin to both states of emotion in Psalm 30, to weeping in the night and to joy in the morning. In the year 1997, Carol Saline and Sharon J. Woolmuth interviewed dozens of mother and daughter pairs, from Janet Leigh and her daughter Jamie Lee Curtis, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her daughter Jane Ginsburg, for their book, Mothers and Daughters. In the introduction's chapter, author Carol Saline wrote, In the course of interviewing so many women for this book, I began to truly understand that there is no such thing as a normal or typical mother-daughter relationship in spite of all the myths. That is hardly surprising. This relationship revolves around the struggle of opposites as we waltz together in anger and love. We want so much from each other, yet we would gladly settle for the simple exchange of acceptance. We blame our mothers on one hand and praise them on the other. 
We shrivel in their disappointment and swell in their pride. We want desperately to be independent while we yearn passionately to be connected. Altogether, Celine writes, if I saw one golden thread sewn into every good relationship, it was simply expressed in the words unconditional love. Over and over again, I watch daughters fill up with tears and declare in their own particular way. I always knew my mother loved me unconditionally, and nothing I could ever do would change it. That sense of ongoing support and acceptance said it all, and its absence was the most consistent feature in the presence of difficulty. Unconditional love a self-sacrificing kind of love that holds strong despite anything that could happen, is a love that we often associate with God's love for the people of this earth. And it is a love that we see again and again from examples of mothers in the Bible, imperfect human beings who could love unconditionally because they were created in God's own image. In Genesis, we read about Rebecca, who was chosen to be Isaac's wife specifically because of her selflessness. When his servant went to the well to find him a wife and saw Rebecca pouring water for others before herself, he immediately knew she was the one. Then she had two sons, Jacob and Esau. She loved them both, but was very protective of Jacob, going so far as to aid him in deceiving his father to steal his brother's blessing. Not a perfect person. But then in chapter 27, verse 13, we see her unconditional love. When Jacob worries about the sin of deception they are committing, and she tells him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Self-sacrifice. Then in Exodus, Jacobed, the mother of Moses, who cannot bring herself to give her baby boy to be killed, as was the law by decree. So she hides him as long as she can disobeying the orders of others for what she feels is right, until she feels he will no longer be safe. And she gives him up, sending him down the river in a basket, never knowing if she will ever see him again, selflessly sacrificing everything so that he might live. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, who sacrificed her reputation, disregarding what others might think of her for seemingly having a baby out of wedlock, going against the norms of the times, breaking with tradition, doing the unthinkable. She sacrifices everything to raise the child of God. And here we are, to use Paul Mundy's words so aptly put, digging at each other with deepening disregard. Even now when we are all suffering, when medical workers are risking their own health to save the lives of so many others, when farmers are having to see the work of their hands thrown out or given away for so much less than the value, when families are mourning and relationships are fracturing, we need heroes, not hatred. And it shouldn't be hard. But it is, because we are an imperfect body of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. And there is selflessness within our hearts. It's there. There is unconditional love. It's there. Jesus made sure of that when he died on the cross. I said last week that we are not on this earth to lock each other out of heaven. We are not on this earth to lock each other out of our hearts either. And I know for some of us that lock has been there so long that the key is rusted and gone, or we threw it away long ago. Well, Matthew 16, 19 tells us Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is the key. So let's find him again and open our hearts here on earth so that they will be open in heaven.
Lord God, as we trust in the resilience of your earth and the resilience of humanity, as we trust in the beauty of your nature that we see around you, as we trust that at night, when darkness falls over the earth, there will be light in the morning. Help us to trust that your light will once again come to this earth and to your people when we open our hearts to your love. Amen.